That was the only picture that they could find me with, with a smile on. Um, and my staff are hoping that they'll get a few from this uh, group. You know, the only thing more intimidating than talking to a bunch of ministers or usually a geriatric ward, which is where my, most of my peers are, is in front of a very young group like you. Because you're extremely critical. So I hope I'm going to be on my, on my toes today. I'm going to talk about the three key words that form the identity of my institute, in, uh, which is a UNESCO institute. Education, peace, and sustainable development. So education for a peaceful and sustainable world. But being a cynic, I just twisted it, and so I came up with that title that when it was introduced about education and the extinction of humanity. Because education can be a double-edged sword. It could be very useful and very potent in terms of getting the benefits to mankind or people kind. Can't use the word mankind anymore. Have to be gender neutral. But again, in a sense, it's, it's, it can be also used in a negative way. And we have seen a lot of that with the increasing amounts of intolerance, the violence that is coming on from extremism, then we have the whole notion of uh, very high growing inequality rates, both within and across the world, countries. We are reducing biodiversity at rates we have never seen before in human history. A lot of uh, issues that are on our cards. And the good news, and I have actually a good, a bad, a good. So two out of three, not bad. I'm not sure how many of you like meatloaf, but I always get inspiration from his two out of three ain't bad. So the first good news is that most of the, uh, the global society has acknowledged these problems, uh, and they've done something about it, something very unique, uh, which I did not expect to see in my lifetime, is that in 2015, 193 countries signed uh, an agreement called this SDGs. How many of you have heard of the SDGs? All right, so I have to stay here. Because if I was going to see a lot of hands, then I'm just going to say I've done my work. But it's the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 very ambitious goals. Well, people call it ambitious. I don't think it's ambitious. It is necessary. If we could have put a person on the moon, we can definitely achieve these. It ranges from reducing inequality, reducing poverty, looking at land degradation, the whole uh, full range of things that we have. So that's the good news. The bad news is that there isn't really an effort to change the mindset. And we really need to have a change in our mindsets to achieve these goals. And what I call the soft competencies. Now, with the SDGs, there's one on education. The focus is on, is on still numeracy, literacy, and the way that our education systems are set up right now. Uh, the whole notion of empathy, the whole notion of respect and appreciation. We still, we at the Institute refuse to use the word tolerance because tolerance is not s sufficient. We need to respect and appreciate and not just tolerate another person. So these are competencies that really are not being uh, passed over to our younger generation. So that's the bad news. Uh, most of the policymakers, when we talk about this, they say, no, it's OK. We have a particular goal there. It's right down. You have to search through it. It's called 4.7. So you have to go through lots of text. And they say education for peace, education for global citizenship. So all the nice words are all there. So we said, OK, fine. And this has been, they said that they have this in all their curriculums. I'm not sure how many of you have had that, but most of us do have that in our curriculums. So when we look at the reviews that are done by the UN, most countries come do very well. There's a tick saying, yes, it's all in the curriculums. So what did we do? We said, well, let's run a survey. So we did a survey. I think the first slide should go up now. So we did a survey, a very quick one, two months, we, but it was, I think, quite 
uh, an attractor, we got 1,526 respondents from 126 countries. Uh, so, well, the critical mass, we didn't get that kind of critical mass. Now, we didn't think about doing what we did, what I'm going to show, it to you, show here. But it sort of naturally fell into these three groups. No exposure to peace education, some moderate exp uh, exposure to peace education, and high exposure to peace education, approximately one third. Now, we didn't design this. It just happened, so we pulled it out. And we had questions relating to empathy, things like, why do you think somebody is poor? Are they lazy? Or is it because of other factors? So the notion of empathy. If there is a problem with a particular country, do you send in your military to take care of it? Or you try to solve with different approaches? So those kind of questions. We had 17 questions. And the interesting fact, and that's the one take-home message which I would like to get across here, is there's no correlation between that peace education. When we say peace education in a broad sense, moral education, we kind of say, have you had exposure to citizenship classes? Have you had exposure to uh, civics classes, moral classes, peace, sustainable development? And with that, we found that there was real no significant distinction between the three different groups, which means what we have right now, the way we teach, doesn't work. Now, I'm not surprised it's not working. Because the education system itself is, established, is set in a way that would not allow this to actually even be mainstreamed. So when I asked myself, so what are my, some of my good memories of school? I sat there and thought, and I thought again, and I thought again, and I said, holy cow, I don't have any good memories. All I have is, Exams, exams, tuitions. I come from Asia, so tuition is part of it. After school, you have to go for private tuitions. Uh, and then in my time, I also had, we had caning. Uh, I had a lot of those. Um, so, it, 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 you know, and then the next thing was exams, you have to be in the top 5%. And if you're not in the top 5%, you're a loser. All right? So, you, so what happens to the 95%? You know, we, we don't think about that. All we want to do is we want to get into the top 5%. Everybody else, we just push aside. So it creates oppressors. It's a predatorial system. We don't think about it, but it is a predatorial system. Now, Paulo Freire, a brilliant Brazilian philosopher and educator, kind of identified this very early on. He said the kind of system that we have is called banking system because it's all about getting information. We don't know how to use that. The second one is the whole oppressor-oppress model. That's of human relations. One is oppressor, the other is oppressed, and it just cascades down. So that's the kind of uh, system that we have. So can we do something about it? Well, the good news is, so that's my second good news, is that another key message that came out from that survey is that there's some sense of empathy across everybody. So what we call it is there's some dissonance within every one of us, cognitive dissonance. We feel that there is a need to help others. Now, some of us think it's charity. I think that's wrong. It should be a sense of entitlement from the other people that we should be sharing. So it's a different mindset. What we have right now is more in terms of as a charity. Philanthropic foundations are pretty much what I would call charity. It's not a sense of entitlement for the others. So we, we need to change that. So what, we th so what we thought was, let's bring in some of the sciences. There's been a lot of science in terms of the neuroscience, in terms of how the brain works, which parts of the brains are used for different, uh, uh, different competencies, as we might call that. So can I have the second slide? So here it is, the famous brain the three-pound mass. Uh, previous speaker had talked about this. Uh, now, if you look at that, I'm drawing from the work of Daniel Kahneman, uh, who won a Nobel Prize in economics, but it was primarily on behavioral stuff. He was a psychologist. Finally, economists realized that they are actually dealing with people. I'm a, I'm a trained economist, and I forgot, you know, we never thought about people. It was very mechanical and mechanistic. So we finally realized, hey, it is about people and behavior. 
So if you look at system one, system two thinking, the system one is the back brain. It's what we basically saw of our instinct reactions. If you haven't read his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, I would definitely advise you to do that. It's a, per, it's a great read. Then the second one is the front brain, which is the rational thinking. It's the slow. It's the logic, control, memory. And then the back one is the fast, emotions, instincts, and reactions. So if you look at this, which has been adapted, you can see that there's a continuous flow. So it's, you know, the, the old theory that only one part of the brain does certain things is no longer really valid. It's all like the professor earlier had talked about synapses and neurons. We have 90 billion neurons and 10 times that much of synapses, connections. So imagine that network. So the whole idea here is to get our system one from a predatorial perspective, from an oppressor kind of a oppressed kind of a model to a one which is a lot more compassionate. So the first gut reaction, something happens is, oh, what about that person? What about society? It's not about just myself. Myself is important as well. But again, the immediate reaction is about the others. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen one generation because our system one has been conditioned for a very, very long in terms of the survival instinct. So we are still in survival instinct mode. We don't need to. We have reached a level where we don't need to be in the survival instinct. The fight versus flight kind of response. And I think we need to move away from that. So that's what I would give the challenge to the education system on how we can modify system one such that it has those soft competencies built right into it. And then system two continues with this rational thinking. Yeah. So we've decided, we, we kind of have three ways that we are thinking of, what we call the humanistic education. So no more the very, what I would call the banking kind of information. It's no more the notion of a utilitarian perspective, just myself. It's more of a humanistic education that we are looking at. So the first one is to no the notion of multiple identities. So multiple identities and experiential learning. It was a really interesting uh, experiment. Uh, Morgan Freeman is kind of narrating a series now called Through the Wormhole. And the first one is on bigots. You know. And one of that was really fascinating where they had a little trap where there was a white mouse put into a trap. And they had another mouse from the same species. And within a few minutes, it, it kind of lifted the trap door and let the other mouse which was trapped out. A sense of helping. Then they did the same thing but put a different species of mouse. But the white mouse was there. And he didn't do it. Because he looked at it as a difference between him between him and her, or whatever the gender was. Then, what they did was they took the two uh, mice and put them in another kind of an enclosure without any traps, let them socialize. And then they repeated the experiment, but they didn't take the different mouse from the one that socialized, but a different, uh, uh, a different mice, but from the same family, put it into the trap, and then the white mouse was let into it. And guess what he did? It went and freed the mouse. So it's a matter of mixing. It's a matter of us not getting comfortable with just one identity, but with multiple identities. So I have, when people ask me, where am I from? I say, I have no idea. I've got multiple identities. I've lived in, uh, I've, ha I've lived in 11 countries, so I've not lived in any country more than five. So I don't have a national kind of identity. I'm a Hindu, but I'm an atheist. And they say, what? You can't be. Of course I can. It allows it. All right? And I like my steak, and I like my scotch. Again, so they said, no, you can be a Hindu then. I said, no, you can, because in multiple identities, and I'm comfortable with them. So we shouldn't have that comfortable. Uh, and then I just, to just irritate my parents, I married outside the, the clan. They're still getting over it, but they will eventually. But it's so exciting because you've got multiple cultures. The diversity is so rich. It's just it's an impressive roller coaster ride, if I can say that. 
So that's one. The second one is about dialogue, peer-to-peer -peer dialogue, is to get people to start listening and talking to each other. Right. And that's really difficult. People just talk, but they don't listen. And I see it a lot in the international negotiations. I come from the UN, I see that all the time. The notion from going from self-righteousness, which we all have as an inherent, neuroscientists will say that, and psychologists will say that, there's a sense of self-righteousness to move from that to self-doubt. My God, can you imagine leaders with self-doubt? Would be a great world to live, because then they know what they're thinking. They need to rethink about what they're doing, because they're not, it doesn't have to be always, might not be right. So the notion of self-doubt becomes a strength. Very, very contrary to the education systems that we have right now, because it shows you to be determined, you need to make your decisions, you have to be strong and make that decision and move forward. Here we're talking about moving away from that. The third one is about critical thinking, uh, critical inquiry and rational thinking. Nobody does that anymore. Have you thought about GDP? You hear that all the time, it irritates me. Every time you say GDP, people, uh, leaders say we need 6% GDP and that's the only way to improve our well-being. Have you really looked at what uh, GDP is about? The poor guy who developed it, he got a Nobel Prize for it, said please do not use GDP as a measure of progress in society. And here, we do that. Has anybody stopped and questioned it? We have stopped because we just take it as blind faith. Blind faith is not good, faith is fine, but we need to go through that process. So these three together form what we call the humanistic education, and there must be, there'll be more, but these are the three that we have kind of taken on, which we find a lot of good results coming back with school kids around 10 to 16 years old. You can see changes uh, across different diversity of religion, race, caste in India, caste, creed, and all that. The last slide, and I want to have this last uh, lesson, is school should be fun. You know, kids should enjoy going to school. This is from Jane McDonald's TED Talk. This is a boy who has just reached the highest level in a game. His dopamine levels have just peaked. Can you imagine having this in a classroom on a daily basis? I, don't, I didn't want to show you the opposite. It's just too depressing. <laughs> but if you have watched Pink Floyd, Hole in the Wall, you know what I'm talking about with those kids. That's what we need to go. That's what schools should be. Schools should be fun, relevant, and thank you very much.